The Scene Society by Eric Fromm. Chapter 7 Various Answers. In the 19th century, men with vision saw the process of decay and dehumanization behind the glamour and wealth and political power of Western society. Some of them were resigned to the necessity of such a turn toward barbarism, others stated an alternative. But whether they took the one or the other position, their criticism was based on a religious, humanistic concept of man in history. By criticizing their own society, they transcended it. They were not rel- relativists who said, as long as the society functions, it is a sane and good society. And as long as the individual is adjusted to his society, he is a sane and healthy individual. Whether we think of Burkhart or Proudhon, of Tolstoy or Baudelaire, of Marx or Kropotkin, they had a concept of man which was essentially a religious and moral one. Man is the end and must never be used as a means. Material production is for man, not man for material production. The aim of life is the unfolding of man's creative powers. The aim of history is a transformation of society into one governed by justice and truth. These are the principles on which explicitly and implicitly all criticism of modern capitalism was based. These religious humanistic principles were also the basis for the proposals for a better society. In fact, the main expression of religious enthusiasm enthusiasm, in the last 200 years is to be found exactly in those movements which had broken with traditional religion. Religion as an organization and a profession of dogma was carried on in the churches. Religion in the sense of religious fervor and living faith was largely carried on by the anti-religionists. In order to give more substance to the statements just made, it is necessary to consider some salient features in the development of Christian Western culture. While for the Greeks, history had no aim, purpose, or end, the Judeo-Christian concept of history was characterized by the idea that its inherent meaning was the salvation of man. The symbol for this final salvation was the Messiah, the time itself, the messianic time. There are, however, two different concepts of what constitutes the eschaton, the end of days, the aim of history. One connects the biblical myth of Adam and Eve with the concept of salvation. Briefly stated, the essence of this idea is that originally man was one with nature. There was no conflict between him and nature or between man and woman. But man also lacked the most essential human trait, that of knowledge of good and evil. Hence, he was incapable of, tr- of free decision and responsibility. The first act of disobedience became also the first act of freedom, thus the beginning of human history. Man is expelled from paradise. He has lost his harmony with nature. He is put on his own feet, but he is weak. His reason is still undeveloped. His power to resist temptation is still small. He has to develop his reason to grow into full humanity in order to achieve a new harmony with nature with himself, and with his fellow men. The aim of history is the full birth of man, his full humanization. Then the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All nations will form a single community, and swords will be transformed into plows. In this concept, God does not perform an act of grace. Man has to go through many errors. He has to sin and to take the consequences. God does not solve his problems for him except by revealing to him the aims of life. Man has to achieve his own salvation. He has to give birth to himself, and at the end of the days, the new harmony, the new peace will be established. The curse pronounced against Adam and Eve will be repealed, as it were, by man's own unfolding in the historical process. The other messianic concept of salvation, which became predominant in the Christian church, is that man can never absolve himself from the corruption he underwent as a consequence of Adam's disobedience. Only God, by an act of grace, can save man. 
and he saved him by becoming human in the person of Christ, who died the sacrificial death of the Savior. Man, through the sacraments of the church, becomes a participant in this salvation, and thus obtains the gift of God's grace. The end of history is the second coming of Christ, which is a supernatural and not a historical event. This tradition continued in the part of the Western world in which the Catholic Church remained dominant. But for the rest of Europe and America in the 18th and 19th centuries, theological thinking lost more and more in vitality. The Age of Enlightenment was characterized by its fight against the Church and clericalism, and the further development of a growing doubt and eventually the negation of all religious concepts. But this negation of religion was only a new form of thought expressing the old religious enthusiasm, especially as far as the meaning and purpose of history was concerned. In the name of reason and happiness, of human dignity and freedom, the messianic idea found a new expression. In France, Condorcet, in his Esquisse d'un tableau historique des progrès de l'esprit humain, from 1793, laid the foundation for the faith in the eventual perfection of the human race, which would bring about a new era of reason and happiness, and to which there were no limitations. The coming of the messianic realm was Condorcet's message, which was to influence Saint Simon, Comte, and Proudhon. Indeed, the fervor of the French Revolution was messianic fervor in secular language. In German Enlightenment philosophy, the same translation from the theological concept of salvation into secular language occurred. Lessing's Die Erzsebung de des Menschengeklichts. German words are so damn long, it's crazy. Anyway, became most influential on German, but also on French thinking. To Lessing, the future was to be the age of reason and self-realization brought about by the education of mankind, thus realizing the promise of Christian revelation. Fichte believed in the coming of a spiritual millennium, Hegel in the realization of God's realm in history, thus translating Christian theology into this worldly philosophy. Hegel's philosophy found its most significant historical continuation in Marx. More clearly, perhaps, than that of many other Enlightenment philosophers, Marx thought, Marx's thought is messianic religious in secular language. All past history is only prehistory. It is the history of self-alienation. With socialism, the realm of human history, of human freedom, will be ushered in. The classless society of justice, brotherliness, and reason will be the beginning of a new world, toward the formation of which all previous history was moving. While it is the main purpose of this chapter to present the ideas of socialism as the most important attempt to find an answer to the ills of capitalism, I shall first discuss briefly the totalitarian answers, and one which may be properly called super-capitalism. Authoritarian Idolatry Fascism, Nazism, and Stalinism have in common that they offered the atomized individual a new refuge and security. These systems are the culmination of alienation. The individual is made to feel powerless and insignificant, but taught to project all his human powers into the figure of the leader, the state, the fatherland, to whom he has to submit and whom he has to worship. He escapes from freedom into a new idolatry, all the achievements of individuality and reason from the late Middle Ages to the 19th century are sacrificed on the altars of the new idols. The new systems were built on the most flagrant lies, both with regard to their programs and to their leaders. In their program, they claimed to fulfill some sort of socialism, when what they were doing was the negation of everything that was meant by this word in the socialist tradition. The figures of their leaders only emphasized the great deception, Mussolini, a cowardly braggart, became a symbol for manliness and courage. Hitler, a maniac of destruction, was praised as the builder of a new Germany. Stalin, a cold-blooded, ambitious schemer, was painted as the loving father of his people.
Nevertheless, in spite of the common element, one must not ignore certain important differences between the three forms of dictatorship. Italy, industrially the weakest of the great Western European powers, remained relatively weak and powerless in spite of her, vict of her victory in the First World War. Her upper classes were unwilling to undertake any of the necessary reforms, especially in the agricultural sphere, and her population was seized by a deep dissatisfaction with the status quo. Fascism was to cure the hurt national vanity by its bragging slogans and to channel the resentment of the masses away from its original objectives. At the same time, it wanted to convert Italy into a more advanced industrial power. It failed in all its realistic aims. Because fascism never made a serious attempt to solve the pressing economic and social problems of Italy, Germany, on the contrary, was the most developed and progressive industrial country in Europe. While fascism could have had at least an economic function, Nazism had none. It was the insurrection of the lower middle class and jobless officers and students, based on the demoralization brought about by military defeat and inflation, and more specifically by the mass unemployment during the Depression after 1929. But it could not have been victorious without the active support of important sectors of financial in and industrial capital, who felt threatened by an ever-increasing dissatisfaction of the masses with the capitalist system. The German Reichstag in the early 1930s had a majority of those parties which partly sincerely and partly insincerely had a program of some kind of anti-capitalism. This threat led important sectors of German capitalism to support Hitler. Russia was the exact opposite of Germany. She was industrially the most backward of all the European great powers, just emerging from a semi-feudal state, even though her industrial sector in itself was highly developed and centralized. The sudden collapse of the Tsarist system had, had created a vacuum, so that Lenin, disbanding the only other force which could have, could have filled this vacuum, the Constituent Assembly, hoped to be able to jump directly from the semi-feudal phase into that of an industrialized socialist system. However, Lenin's policy was not a product of the moment. It was the logical consequence of his political thinking, conceived many years before the outbreak of the Russian Revolution. He, like Marx, believed in the historic mission of the working class to emancipate society, but he had little faith in the will and ability of the working class to achieve this aim spontaneously. Only if the working class was led, so he thought, by a small, well-disciplined group of professional revolutionaries, only if it was forced by the group to execute the laws of history as Lenin saw them, could the revolution succeed and be prevented from ending up in a new version of a class society. The crucial point in Lenin's position was the fact that he had no faith in the spontaneous action of the workers and peasants, and he had no faith in them because he had no faith in man. It is this lack of faith in man which anti-liberal and clerical ideas have in common with Lenin's concept. On the other hand, faith in man is the basis for all genuinely progressive movements throughout history. It is the most essential condition of democracy and of socialism. Faith in mankind without faith in man is either insincere or, if sincere, it leads to the very results which we see in the tragic history of the Inquisition, Robespierre's terror and Lenin's dictatorship. Many democratic socialist and socialist revolutionaries saw the dangers in Lenin's concept. Nobody saw it more clearly than Rosa Luxemburg. She warned that the choice to be made was between democratism and bureaucratism, and the development in Russia proved the correctness of her prediction. While an ardent and uncompromising critic of capitalism, she was a person with an unshakable and profound faith in man. When she and Gustav Landauer were murdered by the soldiers of the German counter-revolution, the humanistic tradition of faith in man was meant to be killed with them. It was this lack of faith in man which made it possible for the authoritarian systems to conquer man, leading him on to have faith in an idol rather than in himself.
between the exploitation in early capitalism and that of Stalinism, there is not a small difference. The brutal exploitation of the worker in early capitalism, even though it was backed by the political power of the state apparatus, did not prevent the, ri the rise of new and progressive ideas. In fact, all great socialist ideas had their birth in this very period, a period in which Owenism could flourish and in which the Chartist movement was destroyed by force only after 10 years. Indeed, the most reactionary government in Europe, that of the Tsar, did not use methods of repression which could be compared with those of Stalinism. Since, since the brutal destruction of the Kronstadt Rebellion, Russia offered no chance for any progressive development, such as even the darkest periods of early capitalism did. Under Stalin, the Soviet system lost the last remnants of its original socialist intentions. The killing of the old guard of Bolsheviks in the 30s was only the final dramatic expression of this fact. In many respects, the Stalinist system shows similarities with the earlier phase of European capitalism, characterized by a quick accumulation of capital and by a ruthless exploitation of the workers. With the difference, however, that political terror is used in place of the economic laws which forced the 19th century worker to accept the economic conditions to which he was exposed. Supercapitalism. Exactly the opposite pole is represented by certain ideas proposed by a group of industrialists in the United States and also in France, seeking for a solution of the industrial problem. The philosophy of this group, which is united into a council of profit-sharing industries, is clearly and lucidly expressed in Incentive Management by James F. Lincoln. For the past 38 years, the executive lead or the executive head of the Lincoln Electric Company. The thinking of this group starts out on premises which in some ways are reminiscent of the above quoted critics of capitalism. The industrialist, writes Lincoln, concentrates on machines and neglects man who is the producer and developer of the machine and obviously has far greater potentialities. He will not consider the fact that undeveloped geniuses are doing manual jobs in his plant where they have neither the opportunity nor are given the incentive to develop themselves to genius or even to normal intelligence and skill. The author feels that the lack of interest of the worker in his work creates dissatisfaction which either leads to a decrease in the productiveness of the worker or to industrial strife and class struggle. He considers his solution not as an embellishment for our industrial system, but as a matter vital to the survival of capitalism. America, he writes, is at the crossroads in this matter. A decision must be made, and soon. There is much lack of understanding by the people generally, yet they must choose. On their decision rests the future of the United States and of the individual. He criticizes, quite in contrast to most defenders of the capitalist system, the prevalence of the profit motive in the industrial system. In industry, he writes, the goal of the company's operation that is stated in the bylaws is to make a profit and profit only. There is no one outside of the stockholders who gets that profit and when and few stockholders generally are workers for the company. As long as that is true, the goal of profit will engender no enthusiasm in the workers. That goal will not do. In fact, most workers feel that too much profit is already given to the stockholder. He, the worker, resents being fooled by economic theories about paying for the tools of production when he often sees these costs being frittered away by incompetence and selfishness in high places. These criticisms are very much the same as they have been made by many socialist critics of capitalism. And they show a sober and realistic appreciation of the economic and human facts. The philosophy behind it, however, is quite the contrary of socialist ideas. Lincoln is convinced that development of the individual can only take place in the fiercely competitive game of life. Selfishness is the driving force that makes the human race what it is, for good or evil.
Hence, it is the force that we must depend on and properly guide if the human race is to progress. He then goes on to differentiate between stupid and intelligent selfishness, the former being the selfishness that permits man to steal, the latter that causes a man to struggle toward perfection, so that he becomes more prosperous. Discussing the incentives for work, Lincoln states that just as with the amateur athlete, the incentive is not money. We can conclude that money is not necessarily an incentive for the industrial workers, nor are sharp nor are short hours, safety, seniority, security, and bargaining power an incentive for work. The only potent incentive, according to him, is recognition of our abilities by our contemporaries and ourselves. As a practical consequence of these ideas, Lincoln suggests a method of industrial organization in which the worker is rewarded for all the things he does that are of help, and penalized if he does not do as well as others in all these same ways. He is a member of the team and is rewarded or penalized, depending on what he can do and does do in all opportunities to win the game. In applying this system, the man is rated by all those who have accurate knowledge of some phase of his work. On this rating, he is rewarded or penalized. This program runs parallel to the write-ups following the playing of a game, or the selecting of an all-American team. The best man gets the praise and the, standing he, and the standing he warrants and craves. In the bonus plan described here, man is rewarded in direct proportion to his contribution to the, to the success of the, of the company. The parallel is obvious. Each man is advanced or retarded in his standing by his current record. He is rated three times per year. The sum of these ratings determines his share in the bonus and advancement. At the time of giving each man his rating, any question that he may want to ask as to why the rating is as it is and how it can be improved is answered in complete detail by the executives responsible. The size of the bonus is determined in this way. 6% of the profit is paid to the stockholders as a dividend. After the dividend is provided for, we set aside seed money for the future of the company. The amount of this seed money is, is determined by the directors based on current operations. The seed money is used for expansion and replacement. After these deductions from the profits, all the balance is divided as bonus among the workers and management. The bonus has represented a total amount of from 20% of wages and salaries per year as a, min as a minimum to a maximum of 28% a year over the last 16 years. The average total bonus for each employee was around $40,000 in 16 years. That is $2,500 per year. All workers have, aside from the bonus, the same basic wage rates as those usual for comp comparable operations. The average employment costs for the employee at the Lincoln factory for 1950 was $7,701, as compared with $3,705 at the General Electric Company. Under this system, the Lincoln Company, which employs around 1,000 workers and employees, has been very prosperous and the sales value of products per employee has been about twice as high as that of the rest of the electric, electrical machinery industry. The number of work stoppages in the Lincoln factory between 1934 and 1945 was zero, as against a minimum of 11 to a maximum of 96 in the rest of the electrical machinery industry. The labor turnover rates were more or less only 25% of those of all other manufacturing industries. The principle involved in incentive management is, in one respect, drastically different from that of traditional capitalism. The worker's wages, instead of being independent from the efforts and results of his work, are related to it. He participates in increasing profits, while the stockholder gets a regular income, which is not quite as directly related to the earnings of the company. The company record the company records. <clears throat> show clearly that the system led to increased productivity of the worker, low labor turnover, and absence of strikes.
But while this system differs in one important respect from the concept and practice of traditional capitalism, it is at the same time the expression of, expression of some of its most important principles, especially as far as the human aspect is concerned. It is based on the principle of selfishness and competition, of monetary reward as the expression of social recognition, and it does not change essentially the position of the worker in the process of work, as far as the meaningfulness of the work for him is concerned. As Lincoln points out again and again, the model for this system is the football team, a group of men fiercely competing with all others outside of the group, competing with each other within the group, and producing results in this spirit of competitive cooperation. Actually, the system of incentive management is the most logical consequence of the capitalistic system. It tends to make every man, the worker and employee as well as the manager, into a small capitalist. It tends to encourage the spirit of competition and selfishness in everybody to transform capitalism in such a way that it comprises the whole of the nation. The profit-sharing system is not as different from traditional capitalistic practices as it pretends to be. It is a glorified form of the piecework system, combined with a certain disregard for the importance of the rates of profit paid to the stockholders. In spite of the talk about the human person, everything, the rating of the work, as well as the amount of the worker's bonus and of the dividends, is determined by the management in an autocratic fashion. The essential principle is sharing of profits, not sharing of work. However, even if the principles are not new, the profit-sharing concept is interesting because it is the most logical aim for a supercapitalism in which the dissatisfaction of the worker is overcome by making him feel that he too is a capitalist and an active participant in the system. <coughs> Socialism. Aside from fascist or Stalinist authoritarianism and supercapitalism of the incentive management type, the third great reaction to and criticism of capitalism is the socialist theory. It is essentially a theoretical vision in contrast to fascism and Stalinism, which became political and social realities. This is so in spite of the fact that socialist governments were in power for a shorter or longer time in England and in Scandinavian countries, since the majority upon which their power rested was so small that they could not transform society beyond the most tentative beginnings of the realization of the program. Unfortunately, at the time of this writing, the words socialism and Marxism have been charged with such an emotional impact that it is difficult to discuss these problems in a calm atmosphere. The association which these words evoke today in many people are those of materialism, godlessness, bloodshed, or the like, briefly of the bad and evil. One can understand such a creation only if one appreciates the degree to which words can assume a magical function, and if one takes into account the decrease in reasonable thought, that is to say, in objectivity, which is so characteristic of our age. The rational response which is evoked by the words socialism and Marxism is furthered by an astounding ignorance on the part of most of those who become hysterical when they hear these words. In spite of the fact that all of Marx's and other socialists' writings are available to be read by everybody, most of those who feel most violently about socialism and Marxism have never read a word by Marx, and many others have only a very super superficial knowledge. If this were not so, it would seem impossible that men with some degree of insight and reason could have distorted the idea of socialism and Marxism to the degree which is current today. Even many liberals and those who are relatively free from hysterical reactions believe that Marxism is a system based on the idea that the interest in material gain is the most active power in man, and that it aims at furthering material greed and its satisfaction. If we only remind ourselves that the main argument in favor of capitalism is the idea that interest in material gain is the main incentive for work, it can easily be seen that the very materialism which is ascribed to socialism is the most characteristic feature of capitalism, and if anyone takes the trouble to study the socialist writers, 
with a modicum of objectivity, he will find that their orientation is exactly the opposite, that they criticize capitalism for its materialism, for its, cri for its crippling effect on the genuinely human powers in man. Indeed, socialism in all its various schools can be understood only as one of the most significant, idealistic, and moral movements of our age. Aside from everything else, one cannot help deploring the political stupidity of this misrepresentation of socialism on the part of the Western democracies. Stalinism won its victories in Russia and Asia by the very appeal which the idea of socialism has on vast masses of the population of the world. The appeal lies in the very idealism of the socialist concept, in the spiritual and moral encouragement which it gives. Just as Hitler used the word socialism to give added appeal to his racial and nationalistic ideas, Stalin misappropriated the concept of socialism and of Marxism for the purpose of his propaganda. His claim is false in the essential points. He separated the purely economic aspect of socialism, that of the socialization of the means of production, from the whole concept of socialism, and perverted its human and social aims into their opposite. The Stalinist system today, in spite of its state ownership of the means of production, is perhaps closer to the early and purely exploitative forms of Western capitalism than to any conceivable idea of a socialist society. An obsessional striving for industrial advance, ruthless disregard for the individual, and greed for personal power are its mainsprings. By accepting the thesis that socialism and Marxism are more or less identical with Stalinism, we do the greatest service in the field of propaganda, which the Stalinists could wish to obtain. Instead of showing the falsity of their claims, we confirm them. This may not be an important problem in the United States, where socialist concepts have no stronghold on the minds of the people. But it is a very serious problem for Europe, and especially for Asia, where the opposite is true. To combat the appeal of Stalinism in those parts of the world, we must uncover this deception and not confirm it. There are considerable differences between the various schools of socialist thought as they have developed since the end of the 18th century, and these differences are significant. However, as happens so often in the history of human thought, the arguments between the representatives of the various schools obscure the fact that the common element among the various socialist thinkers is by far greater and more decisive than are the differences. Socialism as a political movement and at the same time as a theory dealing with the laws of, of society and a diagnosis of its ills may be said to have been started in the French Revolution. By Babeuf. He speaks in favor of the abolition of private ownership of the soil and demands the common consumption of the fruits of the earth the abolition of the difference between rich and poor, ruler and ruled. He believes that the time has come for a republic of the equals, the great hospitable house open for all. In contrast to the relatively simple and primitive theory of Babeuf, Charles Fourier, whose first publication, Terre de Quatre Mouvements, appeared in 1808, offers the most complex and elaborate theory and diagnosis of society. He makes man and his passions a basis of all understanding of society and believes that a healthy society must serve not so much the aim of increasing material wealth as a realization of our basic passion, brotherly love. Among the human passions, he emphasizes particularly the butterfly passion, man's need for change, which corresponds to the many and diverse potentialities present in every human being. Work should be a pleasure, and two daily hours of work should be sufficient. Against the universal organization of great monopolies in all branches of industry, he postulates communal associations in the field of production and consumption, free and voluntary associations in which individualism will combine spontaneously with collectivism. Only in this way can the third historical phase, that of harmony, supersede the two previous ones, that of societies based on relations between slave and master, and that between wage earners and entrepreneurs.
While Fourier was a theoretician with a somewhat obsessional mind, Robert Owen was a man of practice, manager and owner of one of the most one of the best managed textile mills in Scotland. For Owen too, the aim of a new society was not primarily that of increasing production, but the improvement of the most precious things there is, or precious thing there is, man. Like Fourier's, his thinking is based on psychological considerations of man's character. While men are born with certain characteristic traits, their character is definitely determined only by the circumstances under which they live. If the social conditions of life are satisfactory, man's character will develop its inherent virtues. He believed that men were trained in all previous history only to defend themselves or to destroy others. A new social order must be created in which men are trained in principles that would permit them to act in union and to create real and genuine bonds between individuals. Federal groups of 300 and up to 2,000 persons will cover the earth and be organized according to the principle of collective help within each other and among each other. In each community, the local government will work in closest harmony with each individual. An even more drastic condemnation of the principle of authority and hierarchy is to be found in Proudhon's writings. For him, the central problem is not the substitution of one political regime for another, but the building of a political order which is expressive of society itself. He sees as the prime cause of all disorders and ills of society the single and hierarchical organization of authority, and he believes the limitations of the state's task is a matter of life and death for freedom, both collective and individual. Through monopoly, he says, mankind has taken possession of the globe, and through association it will become its real master. His vision of a new social order is based on the idea of reciprocity, where all workers, instead of working for an entrepreneur who pays them and keeps the products, work for one another and thus collaborate in the making of a common product whose profits they share amongst themselves. What is essential for him is that these associations are free and spontaneous and not state-imposed, like the state-financed social workshops demanded by Louis Blanc. Such a state-controlled system, he says, would mean a number of large associations in which labor would be regimented and ultimately enslaved through a state policy of capitalism. What would freedom, universal happiness, civilization have gained? Nothing. We would merely have exchanged our chains and the social idea would have made no step forward we would still be under the same arbitrary power, not to say under the same economic fatalism. Nobody has seen the danger which has come to pass under Stalinism more clearly than Proudhon in the middle of the 19th century, as the passage already quoted clearly indicates. He was also aware of the danger of dogmatism, which should prove so disastrous in the development of the Marxist theory, and he expressed it clearly in a letter to Marx. Let us, he writes, if you wish, search together for the laws of society, the manner in which they are realized, the method according to which we can discover them. But, for God's sake, after having demolished all dogmas, let us not think of indoctrinating the people ourselves. Let us not fall into the contradiction of your compatriot Luther, who began with excommunications and anathemas to found the Protestant theology after having overthrown the Catholic theology. Proudhon's thinking is based on an ethical concept in which self-respect is the first maxim of ethics. From self-respect follows respect of one's neighbor as the second maxim of morality. This concern with the inner change in man as the basis of a new social order was expressed by Proudhon in in a letter, saying... The old world is in a process of dissolution. One can change it only by the integral revolution in the ideas and in the hearts. The same awareness of the dangers of centralization and the same belief in the productive powers of man, although mixed with a romantic glorification of destruction, 
is to be found in the writings of Michael Bakunin. In a letter of 1868, he says, The great teacher of us all, Proudhon, said that the unhappiest combination which might occur could be that socialism should unite itself to absolutism. The striving of the people for economic freedom and material well-being through dictatorship and the concentration of all political and social powers in the state. May the future protect us from the favors of despotism, but may it preserve us from the unhappy consequences and stultifications of indoctrinated or state socialism. Nothing living and human can prosper without freedom, and a form of socialism which would do away with freedom, or which would not recognize it as the sole creative principle and basis, would lead us directly into slavery and bestiality. Fifty years after Proudhon's letter to Marx, Peter Kropotkin summed up his idea of socialism in the statement that the fullest development of individuality will combine with the highest development of voluntary association in all its aspects, in all possible degree, and for all possible purposes. An association that is always changing, that bears in itself the elements of its own duration, that takes on the forms which best correspond at any given moment to the manifold strivings of all. Kropotkin, like many of his socialist predecessors, stressed the inherent tendencies for cooperation and mutual help present in man and in the animal kingdom. Following the humanistic and ethical thought of Kropotkin was one of the last great representatives of anarchist thought, Gustav Landauer. Referring to Proudhon, he said that social revolution bears no resemblance at all to political revolution, that although it cannot come alive and remain living without a good deal of the latter, it is nevertheless a peaceful structure, an organizing of new spirit for new spirit and nothing else. He defined as the task of the socialists and their movement to loosen the hardening of hearts so that what lies buried may rise to the surface, so that what truly lives yet now seems dead may emerge and grow light. The discussion of the theories of Marx and Engels requires more space than that of the other socialist thinkers mentioned above, partly because their theories are more complex covering a wider range and are not without contradictions, partly because the Marxian school of socialism has become the dominant form which socialist thought has assumed in the world. As with all other socialists, Marx's basic concern is man. To be radical, he once wrote, means to go to the root, and the root is man itself, or man himself. The history of the world is nothing but the creation of man, is the history of the birth of man. But all history is also the history of man's alienation from himself, from his own human powers. The consolidation of our own product to an objective force above us, outgrowing our control, defeating our expectations, annihilating our calculations, is one of the main factors in all previous historical development. Man has been the object of circumstances. He must become the subject so that man becomes, becomes the highest being for man. Freedom for Marx is not only freedom from political oppressors, but the freedom from the domination of man by things and circumstances. The free man is the rich man, but not the man, but not the man rich in an economic sense, but rich in the human sense. The wealthy man for Marx is the man who is much and not the one who has much. The analysis of society and of the historical process must begin with man, not with an abstraction, but with a real concrete man and his physiological and psychological qualities. It must begin with a concept of the essence of man and the study of economics and of society serves only the purpose of understanding how circumstances have crippled man how he has become alienated from himself and his powers. The nature of man cannot be deduced from the specific manifestation of human nature as it is engendered by the capitalist system. Our aim must be to know what is good for man, 
But, says Marx, to know what is useful for a dog, one must study dog nature. This nature itself is not to be deduced from the principle of utility. Applying this to man, he that would criticize all human acts, movements, relations, etc., by the principle of utility, must first deal with human nature in general. And then with human nature as modified in each historical epoch. Bentham makes short work of it with the, with the direst naivete. He takes the modern shopkeeper, especially the English shopkeeper, as the normal man. The aim of the development of man, for Marx, is a new harmony between man and man, and between man and nature, a development in which man's relatedness to his fellow man will correspond to his most important human need. Socialism, for him, is an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all, a society in which the full and free development of each individual becomes the ruling principle. This aim he calls the realization of naturalism and of humanism, and states that it is different from idealism as well as from materialism, and yet combines the truth in both of them. How does Marx think this emancipation of man can be attained? His solution is based on the idea that in the capitalistic mode of production, the process of self-alienation has reached its peak because man's physical energy has become a commodity, hence man has become a thing. The working class, he says, is the most alienated class of the population, and for this very reason, the one which will lead the fight for human emancipation. In the socialization of the means of production, he sees the condition for the transformation of man into an active and responsible participant in the social and economic process, and for the overcoming of the split between the individual and the social nature of man. Only when man has recognized and organized his forces, force propre as social forces, it is therefore not necessary, as Rousseau thinks, to change man's nature, to deprive him of his forces force proper and give him new ones of a social character and consequently no longer cuts off his social power from himself in the form of political power i.e. no longer establishes the state as the sphere of organized rule <sighs> only then will the emancipation of mankind be achieved marx assumes that if the worker is not employed anymore the nature and character of his work process will change. Work will become a meaningful expression of human powers, rather than meaningless drudgery. How important this new concept of work was for Marx becomes clear when, he, when we consider that he went so far as to criticize the proposal for complete abolishment of child labor in the Gotha program of the German Socialist Party. While he was, of course, against the exploitation of children, he opposed the principle that children should not work at all, but demanded that education should be combined with manual labor. From the factory system budded, he writes, as Robert Owen has shown us in detail, the germ of the education of the future, an education that will, in the education of every child over a given age, combine productive labor with instruction and humanistics, not only as one of the methods of adding to the efficiency of production, but as the only method of producing fully developed human beings. To Marx, as to Fourier, work must become attractive and correspond to the needs and desires of man. For this reason, he suggests, as Fourier and others did, that nobody should become specialized in one particular kind of work, but should work in different occupations corresponding to his different interests and potentialities. Marx saw in the economic transformation of society from capitalism to socialism the decisive means for the liberation and emancipation of men. For a true democracy, <clears throat> while in his later writings the discussion of economics plays a greater role than that of man and his human needs, the economic sphere became at no point an end in itself and never ceased to be a means for satisfying human needs. This becomes particularly clear in his discussion of what he calls vulgar communism, by which he means a communism in which the exclusive emphasis is on the abolition of private property and the means of production. <clears throat>
physical immediate property remains for it, vulgar communism, the only purpose of life and existence. The quality of the work is not changed, but only extended to all human beings. This communism, by negating the personality of man throughout, is only the consequent expression of private property, which is exactly the negation of man. The vulgar communist is only the perfection of envy and of the leveling process on the basis of an imagined minimum. How little this abolition of private property is a real appropriation of human powers is proven by the abstract negation of the whole world of education and civilization. The return to the unnatural simplicity of the poor man is not a step beyond private property, but a stage which has not even arrived at private property. Much more complex and in many ways contradictory are the views of Marx and Engels on the question of the state. There is no doubt that Marx and Engels were of the opinion that the aim of socialism was not only a classless society, but a stateless society, stateless at least in the sense, as Engels put it, that the state would have the function of the administration of things, and not that of the government of people. Engels said in 1874, quite in line with the formulation Marx gave in the report of the Commission to examine the activities of the Bakunists in 1872, that all socialists were agreed that the state would wither away as a result of victorious socialism. <coughs> These anti-state views of Marx and Engels and their opposition to a centralized form of political authority found a particularly clear expression in Marx's statements on the Paris Commune. In his address to the General Council of the International on the Civil War in France, Marx stressed the necessity of decentralization in place of a centralized state power, the origins of which lie in the principle of the absolute monarchy. There would be a largely decentralized community. The few but important functions still left over for a central government were to be transferred to communal, i.e. strictly answerable officials. The communal constitution would have rendered up to the body social all the powers which have hitherto been devoured by the parasitic excrescence of the state, which fattens on society and inhibits its free movement. He sees in the commune the finally discovered political form in whose sign the economic liberation of labor can march forward. The commune wanted to make individual property a truth by converting the means of production, land, and capital into the mere tools of free and associated labor, and labor amalgamated in producer cooperatives at that. Edward Bernstein pointed out the similarity between these concepts of, Mar of Marx with the anti-statist and anti-centralistic views of Proudhon which Lenin claimed that Marx's comments in no way indicate his favoring of decentralization. It seems that both Bernstein and Lenin were right in their interpretation of the Marx-Engels position, and that the solution of the contradiction lies in the fact that Marx was for centralization, and the withering of the state as the aim for which socialism should strive, and at which it would eventually arrive. But he thought that this would happen only after and not before the working class had seized political power and transformed the state. The seizure of the state was, for Marx, the means which was necessary to arrive at the end, its abolition. Nevertheless, if one considers Marx's activities in the First International, his dogmatic and intolerant attitude to everybody who disagreed with him in the slightest, there can be little doubt that Lenin's centralist interpretation of Marx did no, just, did no injustice to Marx, even though Marx's decentralist agreement with Proudhon was also a genuine part of his views and doctrines. In this very centralism of Marx lies the basis for the tragic development of the socialist idea in Russia. While Lenin may have at least hoped for the, for the eventual achievement of decentralization, an idea which in fact was manifest in the concept of the Soviets, where the decision-making was rooted in the smallest and most concrete level of decentralized groups, Stalinism developed one side of the contradiction, 
the principle of centralization into the practice of the most ruthless state organization the modern world has known, surpassing even the centralization principle which fascism and Nazism followed. The contradiction in Marx goes deeper than is apparent in the contradiction between the principles of centralization and decentralization. On the one hand, Marx, like all other socialists, was convinced that the emancipation of man was not primarily a political, but an economic and social question, that the answer to freedom was not to be found in the change of the political form of the state, but in the economic and social transformation of society. On the other hand, and in spite of their own theories, Marx and Engels were in many ways caught in the traditional concept of the dominance of the political over the socio-economic spheres. They could not free themselves from the traditional view of the importance of the state and political power, from the idea of the primary significance of mere political change, an idea which had been the guiding principle of the great middle-class revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries. In this respect, Marx and Engels were much more bourgeois thinkers than were men like Proudhon, Bakunin, Kropotkin, and Landauer. Paradoxical as it sounds, the Leninist development of socialism represents a regression to the bourgeois concepts of the state and of political power, rather than the new socialist concept as it was expressed so much more clearly by Owen, Proudhon, and others. This paradox in Marxist thinking has been clearly expressed by Buber. <coughs> Marx, he writes, accepted these essential components of the commune idea, but without weighing them up against his own centralism and deciding between them. That he apparently did not see the profound problem that this opens up is due to the hegemony of the political point of view. A hegemony which persisted everywhere for him as far as it, as far as it concerned the revolution, its preparation and its effects. Of the three modes of thinking in public matters, the economic, the social, and the political, Marx exercised the first with methodical mastery, devoted himself with passion to the third, but, absurd as it may sound in the ears of the unqualified Marxist, only very seldom did he come into more intimate contact with the second, and it never became a deciding factor for him. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that. Closely related to Marx's centralism is his attitude toward revolutionary action. While it is true that Marx and Engels admitted that socialist control of the state must not be necessarily acquired by force and revolution, as for instance in England and the United States, it is equally true that on the whole they believed that the working class, in order to obtain their aims, had to seize power by revolution. In fact, they were in favor of universal military service and sometimes of international wars as means which would facilitate the revolutionary seizure of power. Our generation has witnessed the tragic results of force and dictatorship in Russia. We have seen that the application of force within society is as destructive of human welfare as its application in international relations in the form of war. But when today Marx is accused primarily for his advocation of force and revolution, this is a twisting of facts. The idea of political revolution is not a specifically Marxist or socialist idea, but it is the traditional idea of the middle class, bourgeois society in the last 300 years. Because of the fact that the middle class believed that abolition of the political power vested in a monarchy and the seizure of political power by the people was the solution of the social problem, political revolution was seen as a means to the achievement of freedom. Our modern democracy is a result of force and revolution. The Kerensky Revolution of 1917 and the German Revolution of 1918 were warmly greeted in the Western democratic countries. It is the tragic mistake of Marx, a mistake which contributed to the development of Stalinism that he had not freed himself from the traditional over-evaluation of political power and force. But these ideas were part of the previous heritage and not of the new socialist concept. <laughs>
Even a brief discussion of Marx would be incomplete without a reference to, the, to his theory of historical materialism. <clears throat> In the history of thought, this theory is probably the most lasting and important contribution of Marx to the understanding of the laws governing society. His premise is that before man can engage in any kind of cultural activity, he must produce the means for his physical subsistence. The ways in which he produces and consumes are determined by a number of objective conditions. His own physiological constitution, the productive powers which he has at his disposal, and which in turn are conditioned by the fertility of the soil, natural resources, communications, and the techniques which he develops. Marx postulated that the material conditions of man determine his mode of production and consumption, and that these in turn determine his socio-political organization, his practice of life, and eventually his mode of thought and feeling. The widespread misunderstanding of this theory was to interpret it as if Marx had meant that the striving for gain was the main motive in man. Actually, this is the dominant view expressed in capitalistic thinking a view which has stressed again and again that the main incentive for man's work is his interest in monetary rewards. Marx's concept of the significance of the economic factor was not a, was not a psychological one, namely an economic motivation in a subjective sense. It was a sociological one in which the economic development was the objective condition for the cultural development. His main criticism of capitalism was exactly that it had crippled man by the preponderance of economic interests, and socialism for him was a society in which man would be freed from this domination by a more rational and hence productive form of economic organization. Marx's materialism was essentially different from the materialism which was prevalent in the 19th century. In the latter type of materialism, one understood spiritual phenomena as being caused by material phenomena. Thus, for instance, the extreme representatives of this kind of materialism believed that thought was a product of brain activity, just as urine is a product of kidney activity. Marx's, Marx's view, on the other hand, was that the mental and spiritual phenomena must be understood as an outcome of the whole practice of life, as the, as the result of the kind of relatedness of the individual to his fellow men and to nature. Marx, in his dialectic method, overcame the materialism of the 19th century and developed a truly dynamic and holistic theory based on man's activity rather than on his physio physiology. The theory of historical materialism offers important scientific concepts for the understand understanding of the laws of history. It would have become more fruitful had the followers of Marx developed it further rather than permitting it to become bogged down in a sterile dogmatism. The point of development would have been to recognize that Marx and Engels had only made a first step, that of seeing the correlation between the development of economy and culture. Marx had underestimated the complexity of human passions. He had not sufficiently recognized that human nature has itself needs and laws, which are in constant interaction with the economic conditions which shape historical development. Lacking in satisfactory psychological insights, he did not have a sufficient concept of human character and was not aware of the fact that while man was shaped by the form of social and economic organization, he in turn also molded it. He did not sufficiently see the passions and strivings which are rooted in man's nature and in the conditions of his, exis his existence and which are in themselves the most powerful driving force for human development. But these deficiencies are limitations of one-sidedness, as we find them in every productive scientific concept, and Marx and Engels themselves were aware of these limitations. Engels expressed this awareness in a well-known letter, in which he said that because of the newness of their discovery, Marx and he had not paid sufficient attention to the fact that history was not only determined by economic conditions, but that cultural factors in turn also influence the economic basis of society. Marx's own preoccupation became more and more that with the purely economic analysis of capitalism.
The significance of his economic theory is not altered by the fact that his basic assumptions and predictions were only partly right and to a considerable extent mistaken. The latter especially as far as his assumption of the necessity of the relative deterioration of the working class is concerned. He was also wrong in his romantic idealization of the working class, which was a result of a purely theoretical scheme rather than of an ob an observation of the human reality of the working class. But whatever its defects, his economic theory and penetrating analysis of the economic structure of capitalism constitutes a definite progress over all other socialist theories from a scientific viewpoint. However, this strength was at the same time its weakness. While Marx started his economic analysis with the intention of discovering the conditions for the alienation of man, and while he believed that this would require only a relatively short study, he spent the greater part of his scientific work almost exclusively with economic analysis. And while he never lost sight of the aim, the emancipation of man, both the criticism of capitalism and the socialist aim in human terms, became more and more overgrown by economic considerations. He did not recognize the irrational forces in man which make him afraid of freedom and which produce his lust for power and his destructiveness. On the contrary, underlying his concept of man was the implicit assumption of man's natural goodness, which would assert itself as soon as the crippling economic shackles were released. The famous statement at the end of the Communist Manifesto that the workers have nothing to lose but their chains contains a profound psychological error. With their chains, they have also to lose all those irrational needs and satisfactions which were originated while they were wearing the chains. In this respect, Marx and Engels never transcended the naive optimism of the 18th century. This underestimation of the complexity of human passions led to to the three most dangerous errors in Marx's thinking. First of all, <sighs> um, I lost my spot. Oh, first of all, to his neglect of the moral factor in man, just because he assumed that the goodness of man would assert itself automatically when the economic changes had been achieved, he did not see that a better society could not be brought into life by people who had not undergone a moral change within themselves. He paid no attention, at least not explicitly, to the necessity of a new moral orientation, without which all political and economic changes are futile. The second error, stemming from the same source, was Marx's grotesque misjudgment of the chances for the realization of socialism. In contrast to men like Proudhon and Bakunin, and later on Jack London in his Iron Heel, who foresaw the darkness which would un which would envelope 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 the Western world before new light would shine, Marx and Engels believed in the immediate advent of the good society, and were only dimly aware of the possibility of a new barbarism in the form of communist and fascist authoritarianism, and wars of unheard of destructiveness. <coughs> <clears throat> this unrealistic misapprehension was responsible for many of the theoretical and political errors in Marx's and Engels's thinking, and it was the basis for the destruction of socialism which began with Lenin. L with Lenin. The third error was Marx's concept that the socialization of the means of production was not only the necessary but also the sufficient condition for the transformation of the capitalist into a socialist cooperative society. At the bottom of this error is again his oversimplified, over-optimistic, rationalistic picture of man. Just as Freud believed that freeing man from unnatural and over-strict sexual taboos would lead to mental health, Marx believed that the emancipation from exploitation would automatically produce free and cooperative beings. He was as optimistic about the immediate effect of changes in environmental factors as the encyclopedists of the 18th century had been, and had had 
little appreciation for the power of irrational and destructive passions, which were not transformed from one day to another by economic changes. Freud, after the experience of the First World War, came to see this strength of destructiveness and changed his whole system drastically by accepting the drive for destruction as being equally strong and as ineradicable as Eros. Marx never came to such an awareness and never changed his simple formula of socialization of the means of production as a straight way to the socialist, ma- to the socialist aim. The other source for this error was his over-evaluation of, pol- of political and economic rain- arrangements, to which I have pointed above. He was cur- curiously unrealistic in ignoring the fact that it makes very little difference to the personality of the worker, whether the enterprise is owned by the people, the state, a government bureaucracy, or by the private bureaucracy hired by the stockholders. He did not see, quite in contrast to his own theoretical thought, that the only things that matter are the actual and realistic conditions of work, the relation of the worker to his work, to his fellow workers, and to those directing the enterprise. In the later years of his life, Marx seems to have been ready to make certain changes in his theory. The most important one probably under the influence of Bakufin's and Morgan's work led him to believe that the primitive agrarian community based on cooperation and common property in the land was a potent form of social organization, which could lead directly into higher forms of socialization without having to go through the phase of capitalistic production. He expressed this belief in his answer to Vera Zasulich, who asked him about his attitude toward the myrrh, the old forms of agricultural community in Russia. G. Fox has pointed out, I'm sure that's not how you pronounce it, it can't be, but I'm going to say it and you'd say it that way anyway. G. Fox has pointed out the great significance of this change in Marxist theory and also the fact that Marx, in the last eight years of his life, was disappointed and discouraged, sensing the failure of his revolutionary hopes. Engels recognized, as I have mentioned above, the failure to pay enough attention to the power of ideas in their theory of historical materialism. But it was not given to Marx or to Engels to make the necessary drastic revisions in their system. For us in the middle of the 20th century, it is very easy to recognize Marx's fallacy. We have seen the tragic illustration of this fallacy occurring in Russia. While Stalinism proved that a socialist economy can operate successfully from an economic viewpoint, it also proved that it is in itself by no means bound to create a spirit of equality and cooperation. It showed that the ownership of the means of production by the people can become the ideological cloak from the exploitation of the people by an industrial, military, and political bureaucracy. The socialization of certain industries in England undertaken by the Labour government tends to show that to the British miner or worker in the steel or chemical industries, it makes very little difference who appoints the managers of his enterprise, since the actual and realistic conditions of his work remain the same. Summing up, it can be said that the ultimate aims of Marxist socialism were essentially the same as those of the other socialist schools, emancipating man from domination and exploitation by man, freeing freeing him from the preponderance of the economic realm, restoring him as the supreme aim of social life, creating a a new unity between man and man and man and nature. The errors of Marx and Engels, their overestimation of political and legal factors, their naive optimism, their centralistic orientation, were due to the fact that they were much more rooted in the middle class tradition of the 18th and 19th centuries, both psychologically and intellectually, than men like Fourier, Owen, Proudhon, and Kropotkin. Marx's errors were to become important historically because of because the Marxist concept of socialism became victorious in the European continental labor movement. The successors of Marx, the successors of Marx and Engels in the European labor movement 
were so much under the influence of Marx's authority that they did not develop the theory further, but largely repeated the old formulae with an ever-increasing sterility. After the First World War, the Marxist labor movement became strictly divided into hostile camps. Its social democratic wing, after the moral collapse during the First World War, became more and more a party representing the purely economic interests of the working class, together with the trade unions from whom it in turn depended. It carried on the Marxist formula of the socialization of the means of production, like a ritual to be pronounced by the party priests on the proper occasions. The communist wing took a jump of despair, trying to build a socialist society on nothing except seizure of power and socialization of the means of production. The results of this jump led to more frightful results than did the loss of faith in the social democratic parties. Contradictory as the development of these two wings of Marxist socialism is, they have certain elements in common. First, the deep disillusionment and despondency with regard to the over-optimistic hopes which were inherent in the earlier phase of Marxism. In the right wing, this disillusionment often led to the acceptance of nationalism, to the abandonment of a genuine socialist vision, and of any radical criticism of capitalistic society. The same disillusionment led the communist wing under Lenin to an act of despair, to concentration of all efforts into political and purely economic realms, an emphasis which by its neglect of the social sphere was the complete contradiction of the very essence of socialist theory. The other point which both wings of the Marxist movement have in common is there, in the case of Russia, complete neglect of man. The criticism of capitalism became entirely a criticism from an economic standpoint. In the 19th century, when the working class suffered from ruthless exploitation and lived below the standard of dignified existence, this criticism was justified. With the development of capitalism in the 20th century, it became more and more obsolete. Yet it is only a logical consequence of this attitude that the Stalinist bureaucracy in Russia is still feeding the population with the nonsense that workers in capitalistic countries are terribly impoverished and lacking any decent basis for subsistence. The concept of socialism deteriorated more and more in Russia into the formula that socialism meant state ownership of the means of production. The Western country, or in the Western countries, socialism tended more and more to mean higher wages for the workers and to lose its messianic pathos, its appeal to the deepest longings and needs of man. I say intentionally that it tended to become a socialism has by n- that it tended to, to what the fuck I say intentionally that it tended to because socialism has by no means completely lost its humanistic and religious pathos it has even after 1914 been the rallying moral idea for millions of european workers and intellectuals an expression of their hope for the liberation of man for the establishment of new moral values, for the realization of human solidarity. The sharp criticism voiced in the foregoing pages was meant primarily to accentuate the necessity that democratic socialism must return to and concentrate on the human aspects of the social problem, must criticize capitalism from the standpoint of what it does to the human qualities of man, to his soul and his spirit, I must consider any vision of socialism in human terms, asking in what way a socialist society will contribute toward ending the alienation of man, the idolatry of economy, and of the state.